So I do have some questions though. Were you taking still photographs or were you strictly video? Just letting you know, we're gonna take and make copies of whatever you did and that's why I'm asking. Um, the photogra any photographs and videos y'all potentially captured? Potentially captured illegal conduct. This is Red Snapper, like the fish. And these are cops, but marine cops. A month ago, we went to Mississippi on the Gulf of Mexico to interview Ryan Bradley, a fisherman and activist. But then something unexpected happened. Our Red Snapper that we caught that day got raided. What's going on? By the Marine Police. It was honestly a little scary. I mean, look at the guns on these guys. But it got me even more curious about why some fishermen in America are treated like criminals, while others are living like kings. On the other side of the Gulf is Keith Gwinden, also known as Buddy. Gwinden has a fishing empire in Galveston, Texas. A fleet of boats, a fish house, a successful restaurant called Katie's, and even a reality TV show. Big Fish, Texas. A few decades ago, the federal government took a public resource, our ocean and the fish in it, and introduced a market-based system. This solution has been terrible for many fishermen in their communities, but made millionaires out of a lucky few. We're gonna look at how a simple conservation effort put thousands of fishermen out of business, and how that system was designed and pushed by the wealthiest family in America. This is the classroom for More Perfect Union, and today we're looking at how fishermen lost the right to fish. It all comes down to greed. You got a bunch of greedy men who figured out a way to profit off of other people's sweat. And they're gonna keep doing it as long as we allow them to do it. Ryan is a fifth generation fisherman. I grew up shrimping with my grandfather. Probably the first time I ever went out on a commercial shrimping trip, I was about six years old. We were out with a tiny crew because Ryan barely fishes these days. You almost lost one camera person. Don't stand close to the edge when we take off. On this trip, we were fishing for red snapper. If you've ever eaten red snapper, it's probably from the Gulf. Red snapper is a beautiful fish and a high ticket item. Locally, red snapper sells for $10 a pound or more. In grocery stores in New York, it can go for as much as $25 a pound. Us poor fishermen, we're making about 50 cents a pound on this fish, on a fish that's bringing $10 to market. So, you know, I've got a little bit of issue with that. Ryan sells red snapper at local restaurants and markets, but there's a cost before that, the cost for the right to go to sea. Here's what you need to understand. Another fisherman in the Gulf owns the right to catch snapper and leases those rights out to Ryan. This is what's known as a catch share, and it's different than a simple fishing license. A catch share is basically a quota. Regulators set a limit every year of how much fish can be caught and sold. Fishermen get a percentage of that. For generations, fishermen like Ryan fished freely in the ocean. In the Gulf, it was red snapper, grouper, and shrimp. But as fishing industrialized and as demand for seafood went up. What sounds good to you folks tonight? 30 shrimp, please. Great choice. Populations of fish started to collapse. Red snapper in the Gulf was near depletion in the 1990s. So a few fisheries started trying a new way to manage fishing, a market-based solution. This was the catch share program. The rationale went like this. If a fisherman owned the right to fish, he or she would take better care of the stock, sort of the logic behind home ownership. But what happened instead is, like housing, the right to fish became a commodity that could be bought and sold. And that led to two things, a rapid increase in the price of fishing rights and a new class of investors who would rent out the rights, fishery landlords. And that's what happened in the Gulf, where the right to catch snapper quickly got gobbled up by the largest players. From that point, this fishery had been hijacked from real commercial fishermen. Before we went out on the water, Ryan showed me the list of companies and people who own the quota today. If we were to add these up, it's close to 50%. So the top probably 20 people own half of the Red Snapper. Uh, when you have that much consolidation and control, it's easy to manipulate uh, the markets. At the very top of that list is Keith Gwendon. He's just below the regional limit of 6% of the annual quota. Right year 2023, this is how many snapper can be landed in the Gulf of Mexico, 7.4 million pounds. One man has 5% of this. And in 2023, he received 375,454 pounds of red snapper. That's just red snapper. All right, if he was to catch and sell this, I sell my fish for seven and a quarter wholesale. He would make 
$722,000 off of that fish. If he just leased it out, the going rate for the red snapper right now is $450 a pound for the annual allocation. He could make $1.687 million just leasing his fish, never get off his computer chair. But Key still fishes. He's still a fisherman. He also owns boats, leases shares, and runs both a fish house that buys from the fishermen and a popular restaurant. It's a vertically integrated operation. A quarter of the Gulf's fresh fish comes through my business. We couldn't talk to Keith. He was out hunting. But we talked to someone who works with him, Bubba Cochran. Yeah, I sell it exclusively to Buddy. And I've never called him Keith. It's, it makes me laugh every time you call him Keith. Bubba is one of the golf snapper kingpins. He owns 2% of the annual quota and fishes it all every season. Bubba isn't like a lot of the other quota holders in the Gulf. He still goes out on the water. He and Keith, Buddy, run a nonprofit together, the Gulf Reef Shareholders Alliance, that lobbies for the catch share system. Before the quota system, many fisheries were managed as days at sea, as in a boat could only hit the water for a few days or weeks out of the year. That resulted in what was known as derby days, a race to catch a year's worth of fish in a short window of time. And those days were dangerous. There's a reason the show is called The Deadliest Catch. But when the quota system was introduced, fishermen who had been there during the derby days were skeptical. And I was mad. I was gonna go there and cuss them all out and tell them they're putting me out of business. Fishing rights were originally given to fishermen based on how much they'd fished in the past. And Bubba was a deckhand at the time. He didn't have a record of fishing snapper. So he had to buy in. Bubba ended up mortgaging both his house and his father's house in order to buy shares. It was a big risk. A lot of my friends here, they were pretty skeptical about it. This was terrifying for Bubba. He invested half a million dollars for the right to catch a fish that just a few years before was barely holding on. But the investment paid off. Those shares he bought for $10 a pound in 2006 sell for nearly $50 a pound today. About half of the Gulf's quota is held by just 20 fishermen like Bubba and Keith. But Ryan doesn't hold this against them. They both still fish. They've just also made the system work for them. This program, the way it is designed by law, I mean, it could go away at any time. So there's substantial investment in all these quota shares. Uh, if the program could change, there's no recourse for these quota shareholders. They could lose everything they have. So it is a risky investment. We're in a fishing rights bubble, and now that shares themselves are so expensive, when they leave the hands of someone like Bubba, the only ones that can afford to buy them are often massive corporations. In New England, when the biggest ground fish fisherman, known locally as the Codfather, was forced out of the business, his shares went to a private equity-backed company that leased rights and boats to fishermen that didn't have a lot of other options. After a decade in operation, the company unceremoniously shut down, leaving the community of New Bedford drained of one of its chief economic drivers. Okay, so isn't this just Econ 101? When there's a limited resource, the price is gonna go up. Why did no one see this coming? Well, some people did. In the 90s, fishing communities fought to stop catch shares and won a moratorium in Congress. But a few powerful lobbying groups were sold on the program as a method to protect habitats and to make a profit. One of the biggest proponents was the Environmental Defense Fund, a nonprofit with an annual revenue of $210 million. Another was the Walton family. You've probably heard of the Waltons. In an era where billionaires vie for the top slot on the Forbes Riches list, they are still the richest family in America. In the 2000s, the Waltons decided that protecting the oceans was one of their most important missions. It's a matter of leaving this world way better place than where we found it for our children, our grandchildren, future generations. But Walmart is also one of the top sellers of seafood worldwide. And the catch share programs aren't just in the United States. They've pushed for the program in Indonesia, Peru, Ecuador, and Mexico, all in the name of conservation. The board of Walton Family Foundation primarily consists of Wall Street bankers. You know, this whole catch share thing essentially has created a futures market. You know, and that's, I think, it was something that Wall Street always was trying to figure out. You know, there's a futures market for everything else. The Environmental Defense Fund, with backing from the Waltons, lobbied hard. And in 2002, the moratorium was lifted. A few years later, the Obama administration appointed EDF alum to his transition team and began converting federal fisheries to the catch share system. We reached out to the Walton Family Foundation and didn't receive a response, but we were able to talk to the Environmental Defense Fund. Eric Schwab, who works for EDF now, was at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration under Obama. I mean, it was really trying to align the business interests of the 
fishing industry with the conservation needs of the fish stocks to kind of, you know, if you've seen the term, sort of rationalize the fisher. By rationalize, Eric means increase the efficiency and productivity of the fishery. The results were predictable. One of the intended goals of cat shares always was to thin out the fleet. There was a certain level of consolidation um, that sort of naturally occurred. Conserving our oceans is important, and we need solutions to prevent overfishing. But it shouldn't come as a surprise that America's richest family would support a system that doesn't consider the livelihoods of working people. So let's go back to that day out at sea with Ryan. When we landed, after we'd counted and weighed all the fish and packed them up to take them to the local markets, that's when the Marine officers showed up. Ms. Bradley, what do you usually got? While we were filming and waiting on the police, Ryan looks nervous. I couldn't tell if he wanted us to stop filming. I had the thought, was Ryan lying to us? Everything I knew about Ryan so far made me trust him and his operation. But now we were surrounded by state and federal police, and one of them had issued us, the camera crew, a criminal search warrant. Even our sound operator joked that maybe a block of fentanyl was about to fall out of a fish's mouth. In the end, Ryan walked away with all the fish he caught, and I was confused. What was all that about? I talked to Ryan afterwards. He basically wanted to know that we were okay. You know, I, I've been around this industry a while, and, and so I know, you know how they how they treat fishermen, and I don't know what they intended to learn from that. Um, I know certainly we weren't doing anything wrong while we were out there fishing. It turns out this was all just a simple audit. Nobody was doing anything wrong. Ryan wasn't poaching Red Snapper. But these guys were all heavily armed. Guns, tasers, handcuffs. Couldn't this audit have been done with one to two guys with clipboards? I told Eric at EDF what had happened. He didn't seem as shocked as I was. Yeah, and that's a really positive thing, right? Because if you're, you know, a compliant or law-abiding fisherman, you know, you want to see that because you want to make sure that others are, you know, following the same rules that you're adhering to. Otherwise, it creates inequities in the system. The problem with what Eric's saying, though, is there are massive inequities in the system as it works today. So has anyone tried a different sort of system, one that considers environmental concerns and workers' livelihood? And the answer is taking place in fisheries all over the country. Dogfish, monkfish, skate, these are management programs that are not catch shares. That's Brett Tolley. He runs the North American Marine Alliance. These non catch share management programs he's talking about are also federally managed, and they're also limited access. But do they work? The populations have been, they've had their ups and downs, but overall, they're doing great. <laughs> if it ain't broke, then don't fix it, kind of thing. It's not perfect. They have their flaws. There's always improvement for this, but they are fundamentally not a privatization program, and they're doing very well. That's the key for me here. There's no reason we can't have a catch limit without making the quota itself a commodity. Fishermen like Ryan also advocate for tighter caps on how much any individual or company can own, and rules that say that quota holders have to catch the fish themselves. No more leasing, no more armchair fishermen. I, I like to fish, I like to make money when I fish. You know what I mean? You like to be able to feed your family and make a dollar, pay your bills. The story was so fascinating to me because it sits at the heart of what it means to build a more equitable system. The original catch share system was based on an economic philosophy that has since been debunked. The idea of the tragedy of the commons, that resources get gobbled up and destroyed when they're collectively managed. Privatization was seen as a solution. There is nothing inherent that ties privatization to stewardship. It is a false idea that if you own something, you will inherently take better care of it. We've never seen it anywhere in our economy play out that way. As we see consolidation result in the banks crashing and the abuse of pharmaceutical companies, we're watching the same sort of uh, abuse take place on the ocean. When we're designing policies to protect the environment, we should make sure the future we're building centers workers and their communities. Thanks for watching The Classroom. We're working on this series now about jobs that have gotten worse over the last few decades. Is there an industry you want to see us cover? If so, comment below and as always, like and subscribe for more videos like this one.